Hello, this is Professor Keen, and welcome back to my lectures on electricity, magnetism, and light. We are studying the work of James Clerk Maxwell. Specifically, we're looking at his article titled On Action at a Distance, which was published in 1873 in the Proceedings of the Royal Institution of Great Britain. In this article, what James Clerk Maxwell does is he compares and contrasts two competing viewpoints. The viewpoints of those who believe that forces cannot act across empty space, they need some kind of medium to transmit a force, those are the advocates of mediated action, and others who believe that forces can be transmitted across empty space, those are the advocates of action at a distance. We are on page 380 in A Student's Guide to the Great Physics Text, Volume 3, and we've read through the first couple of pages where he is laying out the arguments of those who believe in mediated action. And in summary, the people who believe in mediated action say that, well, in many cases, we experience forces that seem to be acting over empty space, but in reality, they are mediated by some kind of thing that communicates the force from one place to the other. So, for example, when I'm speaking to you, uh, my voice makes it to your ear, and it seems as though it does so without any kind of medium to those who might be ignorant of the properties of air. But once you understand that the space between my mouth and your ear is filled with air, and this air undergoes vibrations because of my voice, and those vibrations travel through the air to your ear, then one understands that this is truly a case of mediated action. So what Maxwell goes on to say is that, well, perhaps even things that seem to be action at a distance or immediate action really are mediated actions. We just don't quite understand the medium so well yet. He's thinking about magnets, for example, or gravity. That brought us to about page 382. And now what he's going to do is present the viewpoint of those who believe in action at a distance. So let's continue our reading. He says in the third full paragraph, the advocates of the doctrine of action at a distance, however, have not been put to silence by such arguments, the ones that he just went through. What right, say they, have we to assert that a body cannot act where it is not? Do we not see an instance of action at a distance in the case of a magnet? which acts on another magnet not only at a distance, but with the most complete indifference to the nature of the matter which occupies the intervening space. If the action depends on something occupying the space between the two magnets, it cannot surely be a matter of indifference whether the space is filled with air or not, or whether wood, glass, or copper be placed between the magnets. So in other words, when you have two magnets that are facing each other with their north and south faces, so let's suppose you have a north pole magnet in this hand and the south pole of another magnet facing it over here, those pull on each other, right? And he's saying here that if there was, if, if, the, if that action or that force depended on something that was between them, then by changing what's between them, it should have an effect on that force. But if you put your hand between them, it does not block that magnetic interaction. And if you put copper or wood or a piece of paper or a piece of steel between them, it still does not change that interaction between the two magnets. And the advocates of action at a distance say, aha, see, this is, this is what we mean when we say action at a distance is correct. There cannot be any kind of dependence on any medium between them if, when you change the medium, it doesn't affect the force. He goes on to say, besides this, Newton's law of gravitation, which every astronomical observation tends only to establish more firmly, asserts not only that the heavenly bodies act on one another across immense intervals of space, but that two portions of matter, the one buried a thousand miles deep in the interior of the earth and the other a hundred thousand miles deep in the body of the sun, they act on one another with precisely the same force as if the strata beneath which each is buried had been non-existent. If any medium takes part in transmitting this action, it must surely make some difference whether the space between the bodies containing nothing but this medium or whether it is occupied by the dense matter of the earth or of the sun. So this is the same kind of argument. Why is it that Newton's law of gravity implies that 
when you have intervening matter between two pieces of matter, that does not affect the gravitational force. And this, by the way, is evident from just looking at Newton's universal law of gravity, which says that if you have two masses, like the sun here and the earth here, they pull on each other with a force. The earth pulls on the sun and the sun pulls on the earth with a force. And that force is equal to the gravitational constant, which is a constant in nature, like the mass of an electron or the speed of light, and the mass of the sun and the mass of the earth divided by the distance between them squared. Now notice here that this force, nowhere in this force is there any property of space or property of the stuff that is in between them. So there's no um, indication that the matter between them has any effect on this gravitational force. Why is that? Well, look at the formula. It only depends on the mass of the sun, the mass of the earth, the distance between them, and some gravitational constant, which is a constant of nature. So nowhere in here do you, do you insert, nowhere in this formula do you use the properties of the matter you put between them. He goes on to say, but the advocates of direct action at a distance are not content with instances of this kind in which the phenomena, even at first sight, appear to favor their doctrine. They push their operations into the enemy's camp and maintain that even when the action is apparently the pressure of contiguous or touching portions of matter, the contiguity is only apparent, that a space always intervenes between the bodies which act on each other, they assert, in short, that so far from action at a distance being impossible, it is the only kind of action which ever occurs, and that the favorite old vis a tergo, or push from behind, of the schools has no existence in nature and exists only in the imagination of the schoolmen. So what he's saying here is the advocates of action at a distance don't merely claim that magnetism and gravity, which are apparently action at a distance, they say those aren't the only instances of action at a distance, even when it seems like things are touching. Those are truly instances of action at a distance. Because he's going to say, when you push your hand against something, um, even when you're pushing your hand against something, there is some very tiny space between your hand and the desk, let's say, or the button on your cell phone. And so even when it seems like things are touching, they're not and there is an action across a distance, a small distance, but a distance nonetheless. And now he goes on to give some examples of that. He says, the best way to prove that when one body pushes another, it does not touch it, is to measure the distance between them. Here are two glass lenses. And so presumably what Maxwell is doing is giving a demonstration now. So I'll draw this after I read the text. Here are two glass lenses, one of which is pressed against the other by means of a weight. By means of the electric light, we may obtain on the screen an image of the place where the one lens presses against the other. A series of colored rings is formed on the screen. These rings were first observed and first explained by Newton. The particular color of any ring depends on the distance between the surfaces of the piece of glass. <clears throat> so why don't I draw a picture? He's talking about what are now referred to as Newton's rings. And so the setup is something like this. You take a hemispherical glass lens that looks like this, and you put it on top of a glass plate. And you illuminate it with a light from above. So I'll indicate that there's light coming in from above like this. He calls it an electric light. And then you place your eye, you look at it from up here. And when you look at it from up here, what do you see? Well, I'll draw a top view of this. So this would be the top view of the lens sitting on the glass plate. And he says, when you do that, you see a series of colored rings that are formed in this region. So I'm gonna draw some rings and then I think he tells us what the colors are. But you see these little rings right here and actually they get closer and closer to one another as one gets farther away until they go over into a kind of a continuous set of rings. Okay, those are called Newton's rings. And if this rings a bell to you, so to speak, uh, this, you saw something very much like this in the laboratory when you took two glass blocks, in that case in the laboratory, 
you took these two glass blocks and you rubber banded them together. So this is one glass block and another glass block and you had a spacing on one side and you illuminated it and looked at it from the top and you saw a series of these fringes going across like this and as you know that's because of the interference between the light reflecting on off of the bottom and the top surfaces of that air gap. That's the same thing that's going on here in Newton's rings except the air gap is circular. It's the gap that's formed between the hemisphere and the glass plate. Okay. He says, Newton formed a table of the colors corresponding to different distances so that by comparing the color of any ring with Newton's table, we may ascertain the distance between the surfaces at that ring. So in other words, by counting how many rings there are and what colors they are, one can determine the width of the gap that's between the two pieces of glass at that particular location. So one has a way of measuring the distance between these two glass plates or the hemisphere, the hemisphere and the glass plate, or the glass blocks in the case of our lab experiment. The colors are arranged in rings because the surfaces are spherical, and therefore the interval between the surfaces depends on the distance from the line joining the centers of the spheres. The central spot of the rings indicates the place where the lenses are nearest together, and each successive ring corresponds to an increase of about the 4,000th part of a millimeter in the distance of the surfaces. The lenses, he says, are now pressed together with a force equal to the weight of an ounce, but there is still a measurable interval between them, even at the place where they are nearest together. They are not in optical contact. To prove this, I apply a greater weight. A new color appears at the central spot, and the diameters of all the rings increase. This shows that the surfaces are now, now nearer than they were at first, but they are not yet in optical contact, for if they were, the central spot would be black. I therefore increase the weight so as to press the lenses into optical contact. So what he's saying here is in the middle at the center point, there is a fringe of a particular color. Let's suppose that it is blue. I'm going to draw a blue dot in the middle. What does that mean? It means that there is enough space between the hemisphere and the glass plate in order to fit a half a wavelength of blue light between them. So that is not a zero distance. And by pressing down on the, the, the hemisphere, if you apply a force to the top of it, you can change the color of the spot in the middle, which means that the, the glass hemisphere and the glass plate are in fact getting nearer to one another. And notice what the critical point is. The glass plate on the bottom is supporting the hemisphere even though they're not touching each other. They're not in optical contact with one another. And we know that because we can change the distance between them. He says, but what we call optical contact is not real contact. Optical contact indicates only that the distance between the surfaces is much less than a wavelength of light. To show that the surfaces are not in real contact, I remove the weights. The rings contract and several of them vanish at the center. Now it is possible to bring two pieces of glass so close together that they will not tend to separate at all, but adhere together so firmly that when torn asunder the glass will break, not at the surface of contact, but at some other place. The glasses must then be many degrees nearer than when in mere optical contact. So he's talking about what's sometimes called cold welding. When you take two pieces of material, you press them together so tightly that they actually join and you try to break them apart and they actually shatter when doing so. He says, thus we have shown that bodies begin to press against each other, and this is his main point, bodies begin to press against each other while still at a measurable distance, and that even when pressed together with great force, they are not in absolute contact, but may be brought nearer still, and that by many degrees. So this is a fairly powerful argument for the advocates of action at a distance. Why then, say the advocates of direct action, action at a distance, should we continue to maintain the doctrine founded only on the rough experience of a pre-scientific age that matter cannot act where it is not, instead of just admitting that all the facts from which our ancestors concluded that contact is essential to action were in reality cases of action at a distance, the distance being too small to be measured by their imperfect means of observation. 
If we are ever to discover the laws of nature, we must do so by obtaining the most accurate acquaintance with the facts of nature, and not by dressing up in philosophical language the loose opinions of men who had no knowledge of the facts which throw the most light on these laws. And as for those who introduce ethereal or other media to account for these actions, without any direct evidence of the existence of such media or any clear understanding of how the media do their work, and who fill all space three or four times over with ethers of different sorts, why, the less these men talk about their philosophical scruples, about admitting action at a distance, the better. So what is he saying here? He's saying that it's a, um, it's a prejudice that people have that there must be some medium for communicating these forces. And these pre-scientific people who believed in ether are the ones who are advocating that you need to have some medium for communicating forces. So he's kind of, he's, he's presenting in a very convincing way the viewpoint of those who believe in action at a distance.